any group of people. I don't want to get into black, white, Polynesian and mm -hmm. when I was at Utah or Southern, Northern, Eastern, West, it doesn't matter. Any group of people and you take away their hope and you take away their opportunity, it's combustible. It's going to blow up. Yeah. And I think it's our job, my coach's job and our job in this university's job to make sure that we can't control some of what's going on in this world, but it's our job to make sure there's hope and opportunity for every player that comes through this program. Welcome everyone back to the School of Greatness podcast. Very excited about this. Our guest is the legendary Urban Meyer. Thank you so much for taking time yeah. out of your busy schedule. We're in the off season, but unfortunately there's never an off season here. So we got a few minutes with you and I'm very excited um, to be here. You know, the last time I was in this facility was 13 years ago. I did my pro day at Ohio State. Yeah, I heard that. I was playing at Capitol. And for whatever reason, they let a D3 guy come in here during the pro day with uh, Santonio Holmes and A.J. Hawk and Bobby Carpenter and those guys. It was probably the most nervous I'd been in any football setting, seeing as Ohio State was a dream of mine. But I was kind of a late bloomer. Didn't really develop till my sophomore, junior year in college. Um, but some good memories here. Running, running that 40 on that, sp that sprint turf was a uh, was challenging time. But uh, it's good to be back, and I'm glad uh, to connect with you. You had a book come out a couple years ago, actually the same week that my book came out. And uh, it's called Above the Line. If you guys don't uh, have this yet, make sure you get this book. I rarely read uh, many books. I have researchers that read for me when I'm interviewing people and give me the notes. But this was a book that I bought myself and read almost all of it. Super inspiring. Make sure you go get this book. Uh, very powerful. And um, I'm just really grateful for who you are and who you've become as a human being. You know, you've had an incredible career as a coach. Joshua Harris is a buddy of mine that I used to train with wow. 13 years ago uh, at the, uh, some facility where the uh, Columbus Destroyers train at. We would train for about six months together, and I texted him last night. He said, tell him, you know, tell him he's the greatest, and I love him very much, and wouldn't be where he is without you as a coach at Bowling Green. Wow. Uh, and you've had an incredible career as a coach, and you've transformed your entire mindset, which is what I'm really excited about, from – being, uh, you know, being obsessive about things that hurt your mind, and I think that hurts your health, into now being obsessive about things that help you and help your team. So I'm really inspired by your transformation, Coach, and congrats on everything you've done. Well, first of all, welcome home. And it's, yeah, thank uh, you. Uh, we did our, our homework, too, and uh, I can say that I had my research team research you <laughs> yeah. because we get asked to do a lot of things. And, sure. and at this point in my life, and we talked about this a minute ago, you said, what kind of interview or what kind of podcast we do? If this can help someone, let's yeah. do it. If it's not, if it's just about football or, you know, who's going to play quarterback or, you know, I'm busy. We, we got things to do. But yeah. at this point, you know, I just, especially with what's going on in this world right now, you just, and I'm, I watch news like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes I, I, I wonder where we're at. Yeah. What time period are we in and what the world's going on? And uh, then you've been given a mission statement to or a, responsibility to coach 120 guys that the next 40 years are going to be dependent upon what goes on for these next two or three yeah and that's 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 strong and yeah. so we devote the majority of our time to making sure that the people in this room our team room that we're making an impact with these people yeah and you're big on leadership and, and developing leaders i heard that you have nine captains coming up this year is that right that was last year last year yeah, nine we had nine captains, captains and uh, we haven't done the captain thing yet that's uh it was a very unique team we had a year ago. It yeah. was all, as I say, very well earned. And I think when you restrict the number of captains, then, you know, I, I don't believe in that at all. We've always had the number of captains uh, according to how many leaders we have. Yeah. Now, I asked Josh if there was one question uh, that I should ask you. What oh would boy. it be? He said, <laughs> he said let me get his exact words. <laughs> he said, um, his ridiculous amount of focus, his belief in his system, and then obviously his ability to get a bunch of strangers to quote unquote buy in. So your ability, you know, you went to different schools for a year or two, a couple of years each, you know, Bowling Green and then Utah. You were there for two seasons. How do you get guys to buy in who are complete strangers, you know, who are 18, 19 with big egos, think they've got it all figured out, have been courted their whole lives, everything handed to them. How do you get them to buy in to a, a philosophy, a belief system, 
and to this obsessive competitive nature that you guys cultivate um, and get these kids to believe. You know, Tim Kite, who's uh, my leadership consultant, and uh, he very uh, instrumental in writing that book. It was yeah. after our national championship season. And I used to live by this uh, quote uh, that, uh, or my own uh, uh, definition of leadership was, it used to be set a standard and demand all live up to that standard. And then you start thinking how shallow of a, that that's, has nothing to do with leadership. And, mm. and I never believed that because there's much more to it than just set a standard. Uh, so the one that is in the book and that we talk quite often about, and I teach our players, leaders, and I teach our coaches, and it's nonstop, is the job of a leader is absolutely first and foremost is to earn trust. And you can only push and lead a person as far as he can trust you. Yeah. So the first thing I've done at each, and I look back now because you know I've been doing this for a while, is the thing that we've done very well and the best group of coaches that I've had uh, the best thing that we've done is we've earned their trust because they understand we care deeply about them. Mm. I didn't, didn't say anything's going to be warm and fuzzy. I didn't say anything's going to be easy, but we care deeply. Yeah. I mean, like deeply about them. And once you start to get those relationships with Josh Harris, John Madsen, uh, the the young man you know in Utah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know the players here. That once those players realize that you care deeply about them, now you can really expound upon that uh, definition of leadership. So the first part is earn trust. And then be it with ex extreme clarity, you know, set the expectations and inspire and equip the people to fulfill those expectations. But before you can do anything, you have to earn their trust. And t that's where I think a lot of leaders fail, coaches fail, because earning trust, put a timetable on that. When does that, sometimes it takes years yeah. to earn trust. And sometimes you only got a player for, so earning trust is the key. How do you do that in two weeks of the most grueling, you know, boot camp that they go through? You don't do that then. You yeah. know, I, I think that's that's just you know, setting this, you know, just understanding that they know that this uh, this is going to be very hard. We mm -hmm. want you to commit. We want you to invest, but it takes much more time than that. You know, we're very in, instrumental in getting to know the player, getting to know, to know the players' families, getting to know mm -hmm. what their dreams are after football. And once the players know, wait a minute, this guy can really help us, or this staff can really help us, that's when the trust takes mm. place. When you're recruiting uh, or cultivating a relationship with a young you know, kid out of high school, what are you speaking into most of the time? Are you speaking into their time at Ohio State, the future, what's possible for them, or is it more speaking into the vision of their dreams after Ohio State? I did. I, I was felt guilty. I think uh, intercollegiate athletics have used players for many, many years. And I'm not going to get into the do they get paid or not get right, paid because right. that's that's a topic for a much different conversation yeah. or a different time. But it all changed when my daughter, my daughter was a very successful volleyball player, and I would go on official, unofficial visits with her and listen to these coaches talk, and I'd be like, wow, do I really sound like that? Mm. You know, they're talking about locker rooms, they're talking about jersey numbers, they're talking about music, and I don't care about any of that. I care about what are you going to do for my kid. And so when I start speaking and recruiting to players now, much deeper than what I have in the past, it's much past, much, we're looking much further beyond getting a degree. Mm -hmm. We're looking much further beyond holding a national championship trophy or whatever, or the yeah. first round draft pick. We're looking farther, be much further beyond all that. We're looking into what do they want to do. With their life after football. After football. Because this football thing is going to come to an end. For yeah. some people, it's in two years, three years, four years. If you're very lucky, it's maybe eight. But it's going to end for everyone. Mm -hmm. And we try to push that as hard as we We don't try. We push that as hard as we can. And that's one of the first pieces of conversation I'll have with people that we're starting to recruit. Yeah. You were able to recruit, you know, top athletes at these less desirable schools, let's say, than Ohio State when you were coaching at other schools. What's the difference between you and other coaches? Like, how do you, what's the things that you're talking about that separates you to want to go to a Bowling Green or a Utah as opposed to being recruited somewhere else? Um, you know. Those are great questions. I'm not sure they did. I think we, uh, <laughs> you know, I had some great evaluators, you know, Kyle yeah. Whittingham, head coach of Utah, I'll never forget. We, we recruited players that were not wanted. Yeah. But he had such, we had such a good plan on how one to identify who those under the radar player, Eric Weddle was a perfect example, one of the best safeties in the NFL in the last 20 years, yeah. was a guy that was unrecruited. Wow. And uh, we go to Utah. And, so it wasn't, it wasn't, we weren't trying to beat people for him. That was more, when you're at a Bowling Green at Utah, a smaller school, the premium's placed on evaluation as much as anything. Evaluation and projection, because you're usually looking at an undersized, a guy like you. Yeah. Here's a guy that are we gonna 
what's the visual of this in two years? Because you're not going to go beat Ohio State. Or right. When I was at Utah, our staff would get mad at me when all of a sudden USC came and offered them. And, oh, no, what do you think? And I said, go to USC. That's what I do. Yeah. The USC, and don't hold that against them. Yeah. We have to do a much better job of identifying the under-the-radar guys. Yeah. What did you, Joshua, also wanted me to ask you about your philosophy and how it's changed or stayed the same since your first head coaching job till to now, the different schools you've been at. Have you evolved your philosophy, or has it always been what your mentors have taught you? No, it's evolved. It's uh, the Josh Harris uh, had a 36-year-old nut job that was a head coach. And, <laughs> You know, thank God we didn't have cell phones back then, or we didn't have. Wow. Uh, it was uh, it was wild, and I took over a program that had a great coach named Gary Blackney. There was a lot of drugs, a lot of other issues that the program kind of slipped a little bit. Uh-huh. Uh, the leadership on the team was non-existent, and we had to make some changes. Yeah. You know, when you go two and nine, and you're getting pounded, you, you know, obviously there's there's guys there that shouldn't be there. Yeah. So we went in and cleansed it. You know, we, uh, we made it so hard that we had 18 to 20 players quit within the first couple of weeks, and they should have. College Division One wow. football wasn't for them. Yeah. But the ones that stayed, uh, we went from 2-9 and nine to 8-3 and three in one of the best turnarounds in it's crazy. college football history. And still to this day, maybe the best group of seniors I've ever had. Really? They were so appreciative. Their whole goal was let's find a way to have a winning season, and we ended up having a heck of a year. You guys were top 25, I think. Weren't you 24, 23, I think? Well, we got up to 16 the year wow. after that. Oh, wow. The first year, I don't believe we made it to the top 25. The second wow. year, we got up to 16. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. What's a non-negotiable for you every single day that you must do in order to be at the top of your game? Non-negotiable is I start, start my day with a Bible study that Tim Kite puts mm-hmm. on that I have to do that. I have to get... Uh, uh, is he the one that texts you the, the quote or Bible quote no, verse? No, Chris Spielman does that. Okay. And then uh, Tim Kite, it's an email. Mm. And uh, we'll go through the book of Galatians. We'll do something. And I have to get that 30 to 40 minutes of that my time. Really? I have to. Or I, I'm sick about it. And we have a coach on our staff, Greg Schiano, that we'll all go into his office. He'll come into mine and we'll actually, we're getting ready to play USC in the Cotton Bowl. And we're going to have a conversation about that. And uh, to say I've always been like that, I've, I've tried to be good about that, but not to the point I am now. I'm uh, non-negotiable, as you put it. Every I, morning. I have to have that every morning. Is there a certain time or does six it... 6 o'clock, 6.30, six, right between the 6 and 6.30. Really? Right have to do it. And how many times would you say you miss a year? Or do you not miss? In the last 365 days? Well, I'll like miss you're... once in a while, but then I catch up throughout the day. You know, if we have a mat drill like we did today at uh, 6 a.m. when the whistle blows, because he doesn't send it out early enough, and I'll get it right afterwards. But I, I don't miss. Really? Yeah. And what happens to your day when you do miss? I, I'll find time to go get you, it. No matter what, you'll I do have it. to go yeah. get it. Yeah, because yeah. wow. I don't feel empty without it. Do you meditate as well? Uh, I, I like to use the word prayer. Yeah. You know, but I, I think it's very similar. Same I thing, think yeah. it's time to get your. It's a. It's actually part of. Uh, uh, what we train our players. There's times you got to get your mind right. Mm-hmm. And some people, unfortunately, the below the line behavior, getting your mind right, is drinking and acting like a fool and doing college stuff or doing other stuff, uh, which I've done. Yeah. I've also tried to learn and be disciplined and learn from great leaders on how to get your mind right. And meditation, prayer, by, by yourself or with someone like a Shiano, someone like, like-minded like people, that's how you get your mind right. And it's a must. How do you get kids who want to live the life, you know, they're getting stuff thrown at them all the time, and they, they live a little bit below the line, right? Little? A lot, right? Yeah. Some, some of them a lot, some of them little. How do you get them to want to say, you know what, live above the line. Don't have fun, essentially. You're telling them not to have fun in their mindset, right? Don't go out and party. Don't go do this with girls. Don't do drinking. How do you get them to say, you know what? Don't have any of that fun, is what they're thinking, and live above the line. Well, I think At 18, 19. And I don't, I don't say don't, don't, don't. Right. You know, God created, you know, the way we are. And, yeah. and I think if, as long as you live the disciplined life, you can still have a lot of fun in your life. Mm-hmm. And I certainly don't want to preach at you because, like I said, Thank God there weren't camera phones back when I was 18 years old. <laughs> However, I always like to say you're here, everybody's here, and you want to be here. The fastest way is draw that straight line and stay away from anything that pulls you off of that straight line. Now we can start talking, you know, for this alcohol, whether it's a bad relationship, whether yeah. it's obviously drugs, those are the three big things that you deal with in college right now. Uh, you want to get pulled off that line, those are the three quickest, well-known ways to do it. Yeah. But don't, there's a great uh, quote actually right over there that says, uh, 
if your dreams, do your habits reflect your dreams and goals? Mm. And if it's not, then change. But that's too easy. And when I have my son, I changed that quote, and it's behind my son has it up in his bedroom, right next to his bed. I, if your habits don't reflect your dreams and goals, change your habits. And then I added, or change your dreams and goals. Don't lie to yourself. Mm -hmm. I hear people say, I want to go play in the NFL, but you're acting like this. Don't, don't lie to you. Lie to me is fine, but don't lie to yourself. And that's when the people start to, you know, start to think, wait a minute now. I'm lying, you know, I, I, I get away, you know, I get where I'm not going to tell everybody exactly what I'm doing. But then you got to look in the mirror and say, do I really want to be a first round draft pick? And I'm doing this. Yeah. And that's when usually it hits home. Now, if you're dealing with someone that, you know, is really that far off the beaten path, then, you know, it's going to take years. But I've seen a lot of transitions pretty quickly when right. they start saying, I want to do this, but don't lie to yourself. Yeah. How important are, are having big dreams for human beings, do you think? Do you think it's important that we have, go uh, after big dreams? I think you know the answer. You know, yeah. and that's every great person or, you know, or, or no, I shouldn't say great. You, it, I don't know if I've ever met a person that didn't have great dreams. You know, what do you do then? What are you just looking for the next sandwich or mm. looking <laughs> for the next meal or what do you? Right. I think every, you know, God created us to have these great dreams. Mm -hmm. So. I would say, I, I don't know if I've ever met a player that, or person or human that's not had great dreams. Yeah. Now, some are a little more serious about achieving them, Yeah, which that's what makes us all so different. Yeah. What's your big dream right now? Uh, my dreams have changed over the years. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there was a long time to go win a national championship, and we did. And uh, my dream right now is to be, a, I'm a grandfather. I want to be the best possible grandfather wow. there is and, and really support my family. Uh, but my professional dreams now is I want to see this room of 120 people have a 100% uh, effective rate of having a job offer waiting for when they're done. Mm. When they finish Ohio State University, we're close to that right now, that they're so well prepared for life after football that, those, that what we talked about earlier, you wanna, have, you wanna see any, any group of people, any group of people. I don't wanna get into black, white, I, Polynesian and mm -hmm. when I was at Utah, or Southern, Northern, Eastern, Western, it doesn't matter, any yeah. group of people and you take away their hope, and you take away their opportunity, it's combustible, it's gonna blow up. Yeah. And I think it's our job, my coach's job and our job and this university's job to make sure that, that we can't control some of what's going on in this world, but it's our job to make sure there's hope and opportunity for every player that comes through this program. Yeah, that's powerful. You're really developing like a leadership center for kids. It's not a football program, it's a leadership center. That's where we changed. The, right? We have really changed, and uh, I'm glad you said that. And that's, yeah. That's a big part of what's in there. That's why I thought it was so important to get that on paper. Because after the 2014 season, it was illogical for what happened that year. We yeah. lost our starting quarterback a week before the first <laughs> game. Crazy. The starting quarterback was a redshirt freshman. He gets hurt in the rivalry game, and then the third string quarterback takes us it's crazy. on a three game journey for a national title. It was unbelievable. And when I heard him say one of the number one's reason is he didn't want to let his teammates down. Mm. Now you know that. Yeah. What we're teaching around here was working that and particular year. Yeah, and I love that you guys have, uh, you know, it's all about playing for each other, playing for your unit, right? Yeah. You have nine different units. Is that what I've... Nine units. Nine Very units. Good. Yeah, I was, I was debriefed. Uh, and everything's about playing for one another, but also competing at the highest level. And I heard from Quinn that you guys track everything. Everything. Every, is that from, like, who sits down the first in team meetings to no. catching passes it's any to... Competitive, it's any competitive environment. And uh, we're, we're actually, that's part of our mantra right now for the 2018 season is that, uh, you know, it's unfortunate, it's unbelievable. I looked one day during the season last year, I just was very upset. We lost a game, and it wasn't just because we lost a great team, but I didn't feel, I didn't feel our team, and I didn't feel the competition. So I looked, I just hit on my iPad competitor, and I was so disappointed what came up. Uh, one of the definitions I saw is someone who takes part in athletic events. And I can't disagree more. That's not a competitor. That's mm -hmm. a take parter. That's a guy that yeah. uh, you know he conforms and he does what he. But he's not competing. And then so I just started playing again. And then I looked up fierce competitor, and that's what I want. That's what we we all need to be. And a fierce competitor is a re refuse to lose. And basically, I added this: when they keep score, we're going to try to win. And we try to teach that throughout this whole program. As long as we're something, someone's keeping score, we're going to do our very best to go win that. Mm. And that's why we train so hard. Yeah. 
What do you think builds more character? Those that uh, win a lot or those that lose a lot? I gotta be politically correct here, but I just, <laughs> I, I, I don't buy that losing builds character. Mm. I don't, I think losing just teaches you, hopefully that teaches you, that gets you that feeling that we all have, that you make want to work harder so you don't want to lose. Yeah. And if you, a winner or loser, and we use this around here quite often, just because you lose, you shouldn't be tagged a loser. If you accept losing, now you're a loser. Yeah. If that you accept it and say that's okay, then or in, in this line of work, I'm talking about college football, yeah. and I think I don't know many professions that aren't like that. Mm -hmm. That uh, if you fail to win, that does not make you a loser. It just makes you want to work that much harder and never let that happen again. Mm -hmm. And that's going to happen. We're going to get knocked down. Uh, but a competitor gets right back up and finds a way to win it next time. Yeah. Wow. What's the biggest loss you've ever had in, mm -hmm. in sports and in life? Well, I lost my mom and dad, and that was, it was tragic. You know, mm -hmm. or not tragic, but you know, my mom was lost her at 63 years old and far too young. And yeah. She never got to experience, never got to see me coach a game, and she used to always talk mm -hmm. to me about that, being a head coach. Yeah. Uh, my father passed away in my arms two weeks before I took oh. the Ohio State job. Oh, my gosh. And that was tough, and that was, you know, I had a great, have a great family. Wow. Those are, you know, off the field losses that, yeah. uh, that was very tough. Yeah, and what about in sports? Biggest loss, whether it's a player, coach. Well, I've had some in the games. You know, there's several that stick out. You know, and uh, we had a tough one this year. But it, it's hard for me to quantify which was the hardest. It's not mm -hmm. fair, probably. I, yeah. know, some come to my head. Yeah, of course. I'm yeah. just not going to share them. Yeah, of course. How important is it that we develop a, a winning mindset and that we strive to win at everything we do, not from a sense of needing to be right? and needing to win to hurt someone else, but just that competitiveness. How important is that that we strive to win in everything we do? I, I think it's essential. I think it's, once again, that's we, we I think we're created to do that. Mm. And well, I why think, do you think that? Well, I think God has a plan for us. Mm -hmm. You know, God was very, uh, uh, you know, I just believe that when, I, I'm once again trying to just put this in, I not many, met many people that don't have that burning desire to go win. And those who haven't, I would imagine, just haven't had that euphoria, that feeling of, mm -hmm. and not so much for yourself. That's why I love football. My daughter's played volleyball. Yeah. The euphoria of winning isn't, say, I won. The euphoria is, is for me to hug my teammate and mm -hmm. say, we found a way to accomplish something. Yeah. And I think that's what's the greatest fulfillment that I have to this day of, is when in that locker room after a win, and not, not, not saying, we, I won, look what we did. We put all the egos, all the selfless, all the selfishness, all the other stuff out of the way, and we went and got something done together. And that's yeah. that's I think we're created that way. Yeah. When you guys start the season, I remember playing in high school. Uh, one of the first I played sophomore year in high school was the first time I played football. That's why I was a late bloomer. I didn't really understand the game until I got into college. Even then, I was still confused. Uh, they just said, "Here, go run here and catch the ball." Um, but I remember the coach had us all sit down and talk about the vision the first day. What's the vision for the season? What do we want to create as a team? Do you have a process in either the first day or the first kind of day like that where you talk about your vision as a team or what the team wants to create together? Sure. I, we're, not, we're not a big uh, goal team. You won't see around here like win the national championship. Mm -hmm. That's too abstract. There's too many variables involved. Yeah. And what happens if you lose one early? Do you just not play? You give up, yeah. yeah so. So we, we do, you know, it's a nine strong. I want to maximize every unit on our team. It's a milita mil militaristic model that we use around here. And that is that, uh, what's our goal every year? And that's to be nine strong. And that means every unit within our team, and it's what we call small unit cohesion, is that every unit performs at their maximum capacity. And the way we recruit around here, the great players we have, if we're performing at maximum capacity, you're probably not going to lose. Mm -hmm. And so our goal, you won't see, uh, you know, let's go win the national title, let's go do this, because there's too many injuries and there's yeah. too many, you're, you're counting on committees to pick you to go play any games. And, mm -hmm. But you know what, we, it's all very comfortable, or not comfortable, but it's all fulfilling if we can look in the mirror and say, you know what, we were nine strong. We maximized who we are, and I'm not just talking about on the field, but that's, that's our goal. Yeah. And, uh, that's a big part of that year too. I learned so much in the last probably 
seven, eight, nine years of my career that we don't talk so much about the, the end all. We're talking about how to get there and the end all that we're all shooting for is uh, nine strong. Mm. I love that. What's the greatest lesson uh, you've learned throughout your coaching days? Oh, no question. One that I've shared with my son and my daughter is I have three athletes in the family and the one mm -hmm. thing that athletics teach you that it's not about you. And that's why I love team sports. I, yeah. I, I wasn't much into the individual sports, not for on purpose, but uh, I'll never forget that my son uh, in Florida, we started a seventh grade high school or seventh grade uh, football program. Yeah. And so I was helping him out. I was a consultant, I didn't coach, but I was yeah, a consultant yeah. and I would go there. I wanted to make sure that everybody's teaching the game correctly. And, and the first couple of days of practice, it wasn't football. Mm. It was the most disgusting display of whatever they were doing. <laughs> it was a bunch of kids running around, falling down and all yeah. that. But what I saw happen, and the coaches were outstanding, but every day they got better. Every day they got better. And I'll never forget my son, Nate, was playing safety. And he goes, and football is a tough sport. Yeah. Tough, tough sport. <laughs> And this big running back came through and he goes up and he you know, had no choice. Because if he had a choice, I'm not sure it hit him. Yeah. And he kind of turned into the guy, the guy ran him right over. And I was right there looking at him and he looked up at me and he had the, you know, water in his eyes, little tears in his eyes. And I said to where I said, get up. Because football and sports teach you to do what? If you're gonna get hit, get up. Mm. And the good thing in team sports, you, you rarely do you have to get up by yourself. Yeah. There's always a hand, someone's gonna help you. And I think that's what's family, that's what you know, my family's all about, that's what this program's all about. And you tell me where else to learn that better than on a football mm -hmm. field. Or my daughter's in volleyball. Yeah. You get knocked down, when you reach your arm up, what's gonna happen? Someone's gonna grab you, they're gonna yeah. pick you up, dust you off, and let's go again. Yeah. Mm. Couple final questions for you. I just wanna respect the time. Um, what do you think is the biggest weakness that you still get to improve on, either as a human being or as a coach? I regress, you know, the win at all costs. Uh, mm. uh, you know, because we do, we, we, you know, college football is very competitive. When you lose a game, you just, I, I just take three steps backwards sometimes, and you have to yeah. get, you know, you have to get your 6.30, get your mind right time, and you have to get everything back in order. So sometimes I disappoint myself with, uh, with that. Uh, not near the extreme that it was before, mm -hmm. but that, that's hard not to fall back into that win at all cost mentality. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a question I ask at the end to all my guests. It's called the three truths. So imagine this was uh, many years from now and you got to pick when it was your last day on earth. It's your last day, you're 100 and however old you want to live, and you say, you know what, I think it's time. Um, you've written many New York Times bestsellers, you've coached as many teams as you want to coach, you've achieved everything you could imagine, more national championships, you've done it all. You've, whatever you want to do, you've done it, all those big dreams. Um, but for whatever reason, all the information that you've put out there, your spoken word, the videos, the written content has been erased for whatever reason. Hypothetical, wow. right? So no one has access to your information anymore. But you have a piece of paper and a pen by your bed before it's the last moment and you get to write down three things you know to be true about all of your experiences you've had in your life, your lessons, things like that. And I call it the three truths question. So these would be the lessons that you would then give to the world. This is all they would have to be remembered by you as your message to the world. What would you say are those three truths? Uh, there is a God and uh, we're created by a great God. Uh, mm -hmm. The second thing is family is everything. Mm -hmm. And then th that is an all cost. You uh, you protect your family at all cost, and teach them, prepare them, and the final thing is the that team is stronger than me. That, mm. that group of people, you know, if you get the right group of people, you you tell me what you can accomplish, and you get the right group of people in a in the right setting, you can you can move mountains. Yeah, and that that's an absolute truth. Yeah. Those are great, I like those. Uh, before I ask the final question, I wanna make sure you guys get a copy of the book. Go get this right now, I'll have it linked up. Um, powerful book, great message. If you wanna build leadership in your company, we have a lot of entrepreneurs that watch this. So if you're trying to build leaders in your company, your team, if you're a teacher or a coach, uh, get this book. It's very powerful information there. Great equations that you guys talk about. What is it? Uh, e plus, e plus R, R, equals R equals O, right? Experience right. plus uh, events in your life. Events 
plus response, uh, response equals outcome. That's right? good. Yeah, powerful. You've got it on there. I'm gonna have to get one of those too if you have an extra one, I'm gonna steal one. Um, so make sure you guys go get this. And you're pretty active on Twitter, or is that someone on your team? Somewhere on my team. Somewhere on your team. But maybe you jump in there every now and then. Make sure you go follow Coach on Twitter. Um, is there anywhere that you do hang out online if people wanted to reach out and leave a comment somewhere to you? Twitter, I do. I go through it myself. Okay, that's, let's check uh, it out. Okay. Uh, I have a team, but I also of course. spend time on it. Yeah, yeah, of course. So make sure you guys go follow Coach on Twitter. We'll have that linked up. Um, before I do get to the final question, I want to acknowledge you for, for a moment, Coach, for your incredible authenticity you know as a as a guy that loves Ohio State football and just sports in general you're such an authentic leader and human being and I love witnessing everything that you've transformed into like I talked about in the beginning and how you continue to evolve as a human being to be there for your wife for your kids to be there for all these young men who are constantly learning so much and evolving and for your coaching staff for, for everything you're a blessing uh, to Ohio, and you've brought a lot to the, the one of my you know favorite places in the world. So I acknowledge you for all the information that you put out there and your your competitiveness as well. It's very powerful and inspiring. Great to be with you. Yeah. Uh, the final question is, what is your definition of greatness? Greatness to me is uh, you're maximized. You maximize your gifts that were given to you. You know, what's if uh, if I'm supposed to be a if I'm, max, if I'm uh, supposed to be a 4.0 student, become a little bit better than a four-point student. So you're maximizing your, if you're a 2.2 student and that's your maximum capacity, push a little bit further. So greatness yeah. to me is maximum capacity. Uh, you're operating at maximum capacity. Mm. Coach Urban Meyer, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.